Okay, so we are recording and we are ready to get started. Uh, we've got to give at least 50 minutes of presentation, so hopefully we'll be good to go. Okay, so um, this is a, a generic CEU one hour presentation and today we're going to be talking about basic pesticide use and plant identification. So the outline for tonight, we're going to talk about soil health and its effects on different pests. So like, why do we soil test? Why do we fertilize? What plants are indicators of different issues or problems in the soil? Plant identification. Of course, we're going to go over quite a few different plants, some of them warm season, some of them cool season, some annuals, some perennials. And just to make a note real quick, warm season are going to be those that grow primarily during the late spring to fall. Cool season are going to be those that grow from about early January into early spring. So, of course, depending on the specific plant, that timeline is going to vary a little bit. But then we'll also talk about control options, pre-emergent and post-emergent control for those different plants. Then lastly, we'll talk about using pesticides. We'll look at some different pesticide labels. We'll look at mixing ratios, um, how it says to mix the product, what to mix it with, what not to mix it with. We'll look at the appropriate use for specific plants, meaning, you know, you might mix it at a different rate for one type of plant or mix it for a basal bark application rather than a broadcast application for another uh, plant. Then we'll look at if any of these products that I have labels for have grazing restrictions. And then of course, we'll look at PPE, personal protective equipment, and what you should be wearing to protect yourself. Okay, so soil health and its effects on pests. I know there's a lot on this screen, but the words were just too good just to, to not share. So the basis of an effective farming system depends on maintenance of a quality soil. Okay, so you have to maintain that soil health, keep it good quality for you to have a successful farming operation. So soil quality affects the soil factors that can affect weed presence, abundance, and type of weeds. Okay, so weed management becomes more problematic when your soil is improperly maintained. So if you have poor soil health and you're not managing your soil, it's going to be harder to manage those weeds. It's also going to be harder to manage the pasture, the forage, the hay production, things like that as well, which is what our goals are. So weeds can be an indicator of a soil problem. A knowledge of these indicators will allow for modification of your soil practices. <clears throat> it could be that, you know, a pesticide is not the answer directly for or I'm sorry, it could be that a pesticide is not the first answer to your problems. It could be that you need to add lime. It could be that you need to aerate your soil. So there could be other factors rather than I have this weed, let's get rid of it. Okay, so lastly, when soils are properly managed, the pasture will grow better crops and lessen the negative influence of weeds. So in essence, the weeds will be easier to maintain if you have a stronger forage, a stronger lawn, et cetera. So two indicators that I thought were interesting just to put in here on this first slide, yellow wood sorrel, which is pictured at the top there, is an indicator of low calcium and high magnesium in the soil. And then <clears throat> dandelion is actually an indicator of low calcium, but high potassium. So that'll come into play a little bit later on. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Oh, well, or we're going to start over. Okay. All right, there we go. So indicators of low soil fertility includes all of these plants here, pictured top to bottom and then um, left top to bottom and then right top to bottom. So left is your annual bluegrass. Bottom here is crabgrass. Top right is white clover and bottom right is broom sedge. Broom sedge, we see that a lot in East Texas. 
So these are all indicators of low fertility soils or poor soil fertility. Um, that could mean any number of things. It could mean that any of those essential nutrients that our soil needs could be low. Could mean um, that the soil is either too acidic or too basic. It could mean that the soil is compacted. It could mean that you need nitrogen, any of the above. Okay. So, like I said, there are essential nutrients that are required for normal growth and development of your desirable plants. So, your forage, your grasses, um, your garden, anything you have planted there. And without those essential nutrients, then the soil will have lower fertility and it will cause more of these common weeds to emerge rather than your desirable plants that often require more nutrients, okay? So to minimize the weed populations in low fertility soils, you want to ensure the fertility program is appropriate for the existing or intended lawn or pasture, okay? So we don't just want to make sure the soil fertility is good because good depends on what our intention is. It depends on what our goal is. Is our goal to raise um, Bermuda grass in a pasture for grazing? Is our goal to raise, you know, um, Tifton 85 grass for hay? Um, is our goal to raise alfalfa? Is our goal to plant a vegetable garden is our goal, a beautifully manicured um, St. Augustine grass lawn. Okay, so our goals are different based on what our intended or desired plant is. Okay. All right, so indicators of moist soil. So a lot of these you're gonna see overlap. So there's annual bluegrass again, top left. Bottom left is yellow nut sedge. Top right is common chickweed. And bottom right is mouse ear chickweed. So these are all indicators of wet soils, which in the early spring here in East Texas, most of the time our soil is going to be wet because it's the rainy season. So whenever we see these type of weeds and they seem to be growing in a moist area, we know, okay, that's an indicator. Those weeds are an indicator, but we need to assess the situation a little more and see, okay, um, are these weeds predominant in turf areas that are often wet? So is this area wet even when we're in a drought or when it's the, a drier season? We need to understand why the area is wet before attempting to correct the situation. So again, is it simply because it's the rainy season? Does the area stay moist even when the weather is dry? Um, it could be a question of, are you irrigating too much? Um, depending on, again, if we're talking about pasture row crops, something like that, are you irrigating too much? Um, or is there runoff from somewhere? You know, where is this water coming from and why is it here? So once we answer that, then we can begin to correct the situation. Okay, if, if it's always moist, then we may need to think about planting something desirable there that does do better in a moist area or okay if we're irrigating too much obviously let's change our irrigation a little bit um if it's just the rainy season can't do much about that you know follow see if it's still an issue later on um later on in the summer in the fall so okay those were moist soil Okay, so these are indicators of drought prone soils. So top left is crabgrass, bottom left is goosegrass, and on the right side is white clover. So again, that's a, that's a repeated one there. But these are all indicators of drought prone soils where the water moves through the soil more quickly. Okay, so the composition and the texture of the soil may be the only reason. It could be that it's sandy soil in which water moves through that much more readily. Um, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So soils that are sandy or low in organic matter are more prone to drought because water moves through them more quickly. Soils that are clay or hold water more easily Okay, sorry, misreading my notes here. Okay, so if you're having a drought 
if you're having these plants pop up in an area and it looks to be as though it's a drought prone area, but you have clay soils or a type of soil that will hold water more readily, then that could be an indication of a more serious issue. Okay, so clay soils, obviously that holds water better. And so if it's not holding water, what's going on? What, you know, what kind of problem are we having? Is there a runoff issue there or something else going on? Or if you have sandy soil and are having this kind of problem, a drought prone area, having these kind of weeds pop up, it could simply mean that you need to add some organic matter to your soil. Organic matter is just going to be, um, could be leaf trash. Um, you never want your organic matter to include any type of weed seeds because then they can pop up wherever you put them. So it's like mulch, um, pine straw, again, leaf trash from the previous fall, all of that's considered organic matter. Um, manure, as long as it's been dried and processed a little bit, and by processed, I mean thoroughly dried out. Um, those are all kinds of organic matter. Okay. All right. Indicators of compacted soil. Get my note going here. Okay. So there are lots of indicators of compacted soils. Um, compacted soil is a common problem in overgrazed areas, or if you have too many cattle running per acre or per area, um, the hoof, <coughs> hoof on the ground will compact the soil. If you are cutting hay and not putting in the nutrients back into the soil after each cutting, that's an, that could be something that causes compacted soils. Um, that tractor moving across that pasture a lot and you're not aerating the soil, you're, like I said, you're not putting those nutrients back into the soil, it can cause compaction. Um, oftentimes, unmanaged pastures over time will be compacted just simply from not being managed. Okay, so these plants. Um, again, we've got annual bluegrass, common chickweed, mouse ear chickweed, and that's top um, left column there. Then in the middle column, that crabgrass again, dandelion, <clears throat> and on the right column, we've got the goosegrass again, and um, white clover. So these are all indicators of compacted soil, kind of went over that already. Um, all of these have also been indicators of low soil fertility, wet soils, or drought-prone soils. So it could seem that these slides may contradict themselves a little bit because if it's drought-prone, which we just talked about, maybe the water's moving through too fast, how could that also mean it's compacted? I know that sounds confusing. Um, or if it's low fertility, and compacted, well then that does make sense, like, a, like a what I talked about before. Um, so the reason, so, sorry, let me back up a minute. So yes, that could be confusing because some of these plants also indicated that they were um, a drought prone soil area. And then they also indicate here that they're compacted soils. So that's why these are only indicators, okay? That means, um, it could be a problem. So again, this is why soil testing is important. We need to determine the actual cause. And the only way to determine the actual cause is by doing a soil test, okay? So we can't confirm that the soil is acidic or um, compacted or uh, drought prone, things like that. If we don't do a soil test because our soil test will tell us more information than just what nutrients are needed and required. It tells us the pH level, if it's too acidic or too basic. It tells us what type of soil it is, um, if it's sandy, clay, loam, what have you like that. Um, and then it can also tell us a few other things depending on what kind of test you get. So the point of this slide, again, these are all indicators of compacted soils. But just because you have dandelions doesn't mean your soil is compacted because you know as well as I do, dandelions can pop up anywhere and everywhere. Um, and then in some cases, white clover may be a desirable crop for you. You may have cattle that you want to graze during the winter season. Um, and so, you know, clovers are good for that. So anyways, point of this, soil testing is important. 
we want to use, you want to learn these indicators to get an idea of what's going on in your soil and then get that soil test to confirm, okay? All right, let's move on. Oh, yeah, okay, so there's a few more indicators. Oh, oops, again, bear with me here. Okay, a few more indicators. So these are all indicators of low light areas, areas with heavy shade. Um, that annual bluegrass, you know, it's everywhere in the winter. Um, coming into the early spring, it, it really is just everywhere. So again, you've got uh, common chickweed, mouse ear chickweed, algae in that middle column there. Uh, bottom middle column is poison ivy. And then on the right is Spanish moss, which any type of moss could be um, an indicator. So these, so moss and algae indicate that the area is too shady for most commonly grown turf grasses, okay? So this makes sense for annual bluegrass and the chickweeds being indicators of shade because with shade often comes moisture. So those were also indicators of moisture, also an indicator of shade, okay? So one way to correct the issue here is if you've got any of these weeds popping up in a shaded area is to plant some kind of desirable turf grass or ground cover um, that is more tolerant of shade. So this is more of a lawn issue, um, low lying ditch swamp type area, um, not necessarily for grazing or pasture. All right, indicators of acidic soils. I found this one pretty interesting. Um, okay, so this is our last group of indicators here. So pictured um, top left and bottom left. Top left is stinging nettle. I discovered this the other day, it hurts. Um, brushed up against it in our pasture and it feels like all the other things that are entitled nettles that sting you. Um, okay, bottom left is broadleaf or common plantain. Top right is prostrate knotweed. Bottom right is, is two pictures, but they're both of red sorrel. So the picture on the right with the hand in it is going to be more like what we see in East Texas. It's not going to get quite as tall, but that is red sorrel. And these are all indicators of acidic soil, meaning the pH is too low. It's going to be a pH of between 5.5 and 6.5 usually which is a little bit low for our desirable turf grasses and forages. So this is a good indicator for hay producers because as hay pastures often become too acidic with the added fertilizer and then removing of more nutrients each time that hay is cut. So a lot of times over the, over the years, hay pastures can become acidic. So when soil is too acidic, calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, which are all essential nutrients, become insoluble and unavailable in the soil. Okay, so that means you may have these essential nutrients in your soil. You may be fertilizing with them regularly, but if your soil is too acidic, those essential nutrients that you're adding in via fertilizer are doing absolutely no good because the soil can't utilize them. Okay, so another reason to do a soil test, check your soil pH, and also to know, you know, do we have enough calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus? Does it say on that soil test <clears throat> that these levels are adequate, but why are we having so many problems? Could be because that soil is too acidic, okay? Okay, so again, if that turf, um, if that soil is showing that it's too acidic, we want to do something like add lime. Um, there's different kinds of lime, different formulation or formats, pelleted, powder, things like that. Um, but typically when something is too acidic, we want to add lime. So also stinging nettle here indicates rich acidic soil. So it could mean that your soil does have the adequate nutrients, but it's a little bit too acidic. So plantains, <clears throat> that bottom left there again, those are typically found in disturbed soils of pastures, roadside parks, lawns, and vacated areas. So 
that's pretty, that makes a lot of sense. You know, those are all vacated, um, not used, not readily managed type areas. So that's where those commonly pop up. <clears throat> and it could mean that those areas are also acidic soils. So prostrate knotweed, the top right there, it's much more of an issue in turf grasses rather than pastures. So that one may not commonly see in pastures, um, whereas these others, the um, stinging nettle, plantain, and red sorrel are more common in, in pastures and even turf grasses. Okay, so moving on from why it's important for us to test our soil and soil health, things like that. Um, we're going to go into plant identification. Okay. All right, so annual bluegrass, I've already talked about it a lot here. It is a cool season annual and it's very invasive um, to yards, to pastures, to your gravel driveway pretty much everywhere. So it's a cool season winter annual grass that spreads by seed. It is native to Europe. It has a smooth leaf blade with a curved boat shaped tip. You can kind of see that in the picture on the right. It definitely looks kind of like a canoe. <clears throat> it has a clumping growth habit. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. It's common in turf grass, ornamental plantings, and gardens. Of course, I already kind of said that. It's pretty much everywhere, though. Um, it prefers moist or compacted soil. So, again, we already talked about that. Herbicide resistance can be an issue with this. Um, and actually, I did, um, I covered this in one of my first educational videos that I've started doing. And a neighbor of mine came over and told me that atrazine, which is one of the recommendations, absolutely had not worked for her. So there are a couple different options. Um, I don't have them all listed here in my notes, but you know, if this is a problem and you've tried certain pesticides and they aren't working, you know, it's kind of a kind of a trial and error thing. So you can always call me, um, let me know what didn't work, and we'll we'll go a different route. But unfortunately, especially for this pro for this product um, for this weed, there is no one and done answer. Okay, so um, so moving on to the control options, um, you can do a pre-emergent control in late summer or early fall because that's going to be before this winter annual emerges. And then you'll probably want to do a second application of a pre-emergent control um, probably about six weeks after that. Um, and again, atrazine is one option, but there's a few other ones we could look at. A post-emergent control is going to be, of course, after the plant emerges, but ideally before the seeds set. So a good rule of thumb is before it blooms. And you want to apply a post-emergent control for annual bluegrass in about January to February. Again, atrazine is a common pre and post-emergent control, but there are others. You could also do a spot treatment with a non-selective herbicide like glyphosate or diquat. And of course, that's why we, we want to do spot treatment on those because those will kill everything or at least um, damage anything else that they're sprayed around. So mechanical removal or hand pulling is going to be best for newly established lawns or vegetable gardens, um, especially if you want to minimize your chemical use and try to avoid some of that resistance that being built up. Okay, so I know this is more of, like I said, a lawn weed, but I'm going to talk about various different grasses and broadleaf weeds throughout that'll be more, um, more for pastures. All right, so moving on to the next one. We've got crabgrass. Um, you're probably all pretty familiar with crabgrass. Um, so the big picture you know, what it looks like in, in yards, you can see there. Then I've got some close-up pictures on the right side, close-up of the stems and ligules, and you can see the little hairs on the stems, and then a picture of the um, 
the bloom seed heads, okay? So crabgrass can actually have a high forage quality, but of course can become invasive if it's competing for a, for warm se- other warm season forages. Um, it's invasive in lawns, and it, it again, it's a warm season annual. So it's going to be reseeded every year. It's going to come, it's going to die off and then come back by seed. So as a forage, it has low to medium yield as compared to other warm season forages. So if for some reason you wanted to cut this for hay, you're going to get less than what you would cut the same area of, say, Bermuda grass. But it's going to be higher in forage quality. So it's going to be higher in nutrient value sometimes. And I apologize, you might hear my dogs barking through this. Okay, where was I? So as a forage, it has low to medium yield as compared to other warm season forages, but it has a higher forage quality, so higher nutrient value. Uh, Crabgrass is also a prolific seed producer. And again, if you were to cut it for hay, it has a slower drying rate than other forages. So as an invasive in your lawns, Because of the high volume seed production, it can become very problematic very fast and, of course, compete for growth among your other warm season perennial grasses, your desirable grasses. Um, When you're so when you cut crabgrass, it often turns brown or black once it's dried, which going back to using this as a forage or as an invasive in a Bermuda grass hay pasture. Um, if you have any crabgrass in that hay, it's going to diminish the hay value because of that black or brown color. So crabgrass also thrives in closely mowed or thin turf grass. So again, if there, you know, it's got less competition there, so it's going to grow more readily. The leaf structure. Um, There are actually two types of crabgrass, smooth and large. They're both pretty similar, but smooth crabgrass is a low growing plant spread by seed and rootings. So even though it's an annual, there are, it will spread throughout the season by roots. It grows upwards of six inches, only if not mowed. And the young leaves are typically lighter green in color and very um, conspicuous, easy to see those, easy to determine those in your, in your lawn or pasture. It is patch or clump forming. And sometimes there's a reddish tint visible at the base of the leaf. Um, you can't really see that in these pictures. Maybe in that top right one, you can kind of see it right there maybe. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse on the screen, so I may be pointing at nothing. Um, Okay, so moving on. Um, The flowering stem, which there is in that bottom right picture, has many seed pods, which you can see there. Um, Okay, now moving on to large crabgrass. So it's also low growing, low growing to the ground, also spread by seed and throughout the season by rootings. Again, the young leaves are light green and are more hairy in large crabgrass. The flower stalk is a little bit taller and longer, taller or longer than in small crabgrass. So crabgrass is unlike Dallas or Bermuda grass um, because those are spread by rhizomes underground and above ground by rooting stems known as stolons. So that's how you can kind of determine the difference between them um, if you're not familiar with what the seed head looks like, that crabgrass um, is spread by seed and the rootings are a little bit smaller and there's no uh, rhizomes. So control of crabgrass, which I know is the most important thing to y'all. Um, a pre-emergent control, it would be uh, pendimethalin, which is in the product called Prowl H2O. So that's a good pre-emergent, which you would want to apply in late winter or early spring, since this is a warm season. And Prowl H2O is labeled for dormant Bermuda and Bahia grass. So again, we want to get that application out before our um, Bermuda grass or Bahia grass breaks dormancy. 
a post-emergent control for crabgrass is going to be um, Pastora, which contains, and there, there are other products other than these that contain these active ingredients, but Pastora is a good one. It contains um, Nico sulfuron and Met sulfuron. Then you could also do a non-selective spot treatment with glyphosate, which is Roundup. Um, and again, that should only be used as a spot treatment. And Pastora should only be used in Bermuda grass pastures. It's actually only labeled for Bermuda grass fields. Okay. On to the next one, maybe. Okay, goosegrass. So this one I actually didn't know very much about beforehand, um, but it seems pretty simple. So it's a warm season annual and the spikelets resemble a zipper, which you can kind of see um, in the picture on the left. It's a summer annual. So it's going to come back by seed. Um, in years to come, it's not going to go dormant and then come back by its roots. It is also clumping. Its stems are flattened with a silver to white color in the center, which you can see that. The spikelet on the inflorescence resemble a zipper, which I already said. Um, this weed is widespread. It's often found in compacted soils, which we already talked about. And so it's very common on putting greens and golf courses. It germinates when the temperatures reach 85 to 95 degrees during the day. So it's a little bit later maturing warm season grass than some of your other ones. It's about four to six weeks after crabgrass is when it will emerge. So how to control goosegrass? Um, aeration of the soil to reduce soil compaction is going to be your first option. Then we can try chemical control. Pre-emergent would be something like prodiamine, pendimethalin, trifluralin. No, I can't say that one. Trifluralin, and you would want to apply those in mid-spring before it emerges. Then a post-emergent control is going to be an FPP or a metribuzin. Um, I'm not really familiar with a lot of those. I'm familiar with prodiamine, but um, we'd have to look at the label make sure how to apply those if goose, goose grass is an issue for you and aerating the soil hasn't helped. Okay, moving on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, bahia grass. So y'all are all probably familiar with this one. Um, it's a warm season perennial. It's characterized by the V-shaped seed head. So if you see that V shape there, you know it's gotta be bahia grass. Um, it is known as a forage and it can be invasive. So as, so again, it's a warm season perennial. It is very coarsely textured. It's also a bunch grass. It has aggressive rhizomes underground that can be purplish in color. So it's, it can grow and spread and become invasive very quickly. Again, that V-shaped seed head. It can take over pastures, like I said, because it's very tolerant of low soil fertility and soil acidity, which is something like Bermuda grass is not as tolerant of, okay? It can grow six to 24 inches tall. You can kind of see that there. Uh, the leaves are basal and stiff, so the leaves stay low to the ground. Uh, the leaves are also flat or folded and usually hairless. It's kind of hard to see in the picture, but you're probably familiar with it. So bahia grass is not native to the United States. It's introduced and it actually comes from Mexico and Central America. So even though it could be a decent forage for livestock, it's going to be a poor forage for wildlife. So as a forage, um, again, it has excellent adapt adaptation, which if it's a desirable forage, you say excellent adapt adaptation. If it's a nuisance for you, then you're going to say can take over pastures. So it's all about how you look at it, um, how you assess the situation and what your situation is. Um, so again, it's easier to manage because it's more aggressive in the soil. Um, it's more persistent under poor conditions. Again, it's kind of saying the same thing. Um, it tolerates 
less fertilization and more grazing than does a Bermuda grass. It does well under sandy soils, um, sandy to clay soils, um, even with low or high fertility. And it actually prefers a lower pH. So a pH 5.5 to 6.5 is going to be okay for bahia grass. So if this is an invasive in your pasture, um, a post-emergent control um, containing 2,4-D and MSM, like a product, uh, product like Chaparral is going to work well for you, or any of the Cimarron products, which also contain MSM, but they don't contain 2,4-D, I believe. So there are control options for it um, that are going to be safe for your Bermuda grass fields. But also, if you're looking for a lower maintenance, crop for your grazing pasture, the hay grass is not necessarily a bad option. Um, you know, you have people that love it, you have people that hate it. So again, it's really what your goals, goals are and what your maintenance uh, management plan is in your own pasture. I don't hate the hay grass. I think it's a good option, especially when we're in a drought or the unknown happens, um, which is pretty much all the time. So it's going to be a little bit lower in um, protein content than your Bermuda grass is, but not by much. Um, so it could mean that you'll want to add in a protein supplement a little bit more um, for your cattle if you're grazing the hay grass. All right, let's move on from that and go to Dallas grass. So Dallas grass is another one that can be a forage, excuse me, um, but can also be invasive. It's also a warm season perennial and it's characterized by an abundant seed head. So you see on the top right there, um, that's a good way to determine the difference between Bahia grass and Dallas grass. Your Dallas grass is going to have much more than the V shape. It's going to have five to seven um, seed heads on it. So it's, again, a warm season perennial, and it's difficult to control due to um, the deep aggressive rhizome, so that underground root system. It's also clumping. The inflorescence contains two to eight branches with multiple spikelets. Again, those are the seed heads that we already talked about. So Dallas grass tolerates low mowing height, so again, that kind of goes along the same lines. It thrives more in lower quality, um, poor, poorly managed soils. So it grows in bunches, which I think I already said. Um, it is not native to the United States. It was introduced in the 1800s. It is a native of South America. So as a forage, okay, Dallas grass is highly palatable. So the cows like it, they'll eat it. And it has a higher level of nutritive value than your Bahia grass and some Bermuda grass varieties. So, like I was talking about, Bahia grass is lower quality than some than Bermuda grass. Your Dallas grass is actually going to be higher in quality for the most part, but it produces a lower dry matter matter yield. So when it's cut for hay, again, it's going to produce less. Um, I think. That's how the Bahia grass was as well. So you're going to have the same amount in the field and have less in the barn. Dallas grass, you're probably also familiar, has a huge potential for ergot fungus, which infects the seed heads and causes a toxicity in cattle called Dallas grass staggers. Um, typically, the seed head, it only affects the seed head in the late summer or fall. And you can correct the issue by cutting off that seed head, mowing it, just not letting your cattle graze when that seed head is infected. Um, let's see here. So um, signs of the fungus in infected animals, they're gonna have neurological symptoms, trembling, uncoordinated movements. Sometimes they can be aggressive. And again, this problem can be avoided if you remove the seed heads. So in turf grass, it is invasive and control options. So there is no effective pre-emergent control on established plants. So post-emergent control, 
unfortunately, glyphosate, which is Roundup, which is a non-selective herbicide, is going to be the only effective post-emergent control option. So again, you're going to want to spray when the plants are young, less than six inches in height, and spot treatment is recommended so that we don't affect our Bermuda grass or turf grass, whatever we're trying to grow. Now, there is a short period of time in late fall to early winter when the Bermuda grass has gone dormant, but the Dallas grass is still green. And this would be a good time to spray uh, your glyphosate, and it could be sprayed effectively contr to control a large stand of Dallas grass. MSMA is labeled for use in turf grasses to apply in the fall. Um, when the average 24 hour air temperature is below 72 degrees. So again, that's kind of saying the same thing once it cools off and your warm season um, turf grasses are gonna be going into dormancy, is gonna be a good time to spray your MSMA and your turf grass. So then it's also going to warrant a second, second application um, just because this is so invasive. So another product recommended for zoysia grass, which is a type of um, turf grass and Bermuda grass on your lawn. So another product is Tribute Total. I'm not really familiar with that product, but again, it's recommended for use in zoysia grass or Bermuda grass in your lawn only, not Bermuda grass in your pasture, okay? There are a few other products, again, recommended for specific types of turf grasses. Um, just just like that one is. So if you're interested in those, if Dallas grass is a serious problem, um, there is an article called Dallas grass in turf grass on the AgriLife library page that you can go look at. I believe I covered everything there. Okay. Hey, we're about halfway through my slide set, so we're looking good on time. Um, okay, so plan identification. We've got yellow nut sedge and purple nut sedge. This one is more of a lawn turf grass problem. Both are perennial sedges, and they're characterized by their triangular stems. So yellow nut sedge, again, you can see that on the left. The seed heads have more of a yellow tint is a perennial sedge, so it's not a grassy weed and it's not a broadleaf weed, it's a sedge, which is their own little set of weeds and plants. Okay, it has three ranked leaves and triangular stems. It is intensely spreading, we know that, it grows everywhere, um, but it's intensely spreading because the tubers at the end of the rhizomes and the underground root system, a single plant can produce several hundred tubers. So the tubers in yellow nut sedge are spherical and smooth, whereas in purple nut sedge, they are um, oblong, coarse, and hairy. Sorry. Uh, okay, so going back to yellow nut sedge, it contains deeply packed clusters, which you can see there and probably in your own lawns, you know it can get really thick. Um, each Cluster can have um, 10 to 50 spikelets, so that's that top yellow part of that um, seed head. And leaf tips and yellow nut sedge end in a very fine tip, which I'll show you in the next slide compared to purple nut sedge. So purple nut sedge, very similar. Um, it's a, a little bit smaller, um, doesn't grow as tall. But again, perennial sedge has three ranked leaves and triangular stems. It has hairy tubers connected by rhizomes. One plant, again, can produce several hundred tubers. The tubers for purple nut sedge are oblong, coarse, and hairy. Again, for yellow nut sedge, they were um, spherical and smooth. So the inflorescence, which again is the top of that plant, is going to be dark red to purple, and the deeply packed clusters with two to 12 spikelets. So spikelets, again, seed heads. So it's gonna have a few less than your yellow nut sedge, but still a lot. Um, the leaf tips and purple nut sedge are blunt. So for control and pastures, 
which it can be an issue of. Um, having a healthy, dense stand of forage to choke out the nut sedge is going to be your best option. Chemical control options in pastures, your only option, well, there's two options, um, a post-emergent spot treatment of glyphosate, since it's not selective, or a um, application of sulfur sulfuron, which is in the product called Outrider. But that is only labeled for Bermuda grass pastures or hay meadows. So if you're not grazing Bermuda or if you're not growing Bermuda grass, then glyphosate is going to be your only option. Um, but again, if you have a healthy, dense stand and can fertilize your desirable forage, you should be able to choke it out. So um, for control in lawns, chemical control options, um, nut sedge killer, you know, there's a few different products out there specifically labeled for nut sedge. But on those, you always want to make sure that it's appropriate for your type of lawn. So whether it's appropriate for zoysia grass or carpet grass or um, if you're growing Bermuda grass in your lawn, you want to make sure that whatever product that you have or that you get that's labeled for nut sedge is also labeled for your type of desirable grass. Okay, and if you're interested in more about nut sedge, um, there was an article called Nut Sedge and Kylina Species Control for Homeowner for Homeowners. And again, that was on the AgriLife Library page, which I can I can also forward it to you if you're interested. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Um, the comparison of the yellow nut sedge fine leaf tip here versus the purple nut sedge it's going to be more broad and blunt so see, i'm going to take just a 30 second break here and make sure y'all are all still with me give me one second oh i just what did i think Oh, okay, Jeff, we can talk about armyworms in just a little bit. Perfect, perfect. Y'all are here. Okay, good deal. All right, let's go back to presentation. Of course, it started over. All right, okay, moving on. Broom sedge. Okay, like I said earlier, this one is really common in East Texas. Um, broom sedge is a warm season perennial grass, and it's an indicator of poor soil fertility. Um, broom sedge, it's actually called broom sedge blue stem, and it is not a sedge like the nut sedges we just talked about, but it is considered a grass. So a little bit of a tricky name there. So it is a bunch grass. It has a flat base that is usually yellow and flattened sheets that are hairy along the margin of the upper blade surface toward the base. The upper two thirds of the plant are freely branching, um, which you can see there at the top of both of those plants, um, lots of branched leaves, stems there. Um, so the leaves turn straw yellow when it's mature. So that picture on the left there is not dead dormant season. Um, that's after it's mature. The picture on the right is when it's young and actively growing. So the seed heads are partially enclosed in the sheath and these uh, broom sedge can grow upwards of 24 to 48 inches tall. So um, some of y'all probably have some of that in your pastures or along the outskirts in the ditch or around the ditch areas um, on the roadside. It's really common. So it grows best in loose, sandy, moist soils and overgrazed pastures. Um, like I said, it's an indicator of poor soil fertility, eroded soils, and it often grows where desired vegetation will not thrive. So it thrives in low soil pH, 
and um, it's easily spread by seed. Um, the wind easily spreads the seed, so it can pop up lots of places. Um, it's a poor competitor with other forages, and it has poor nutritive value to livestock. So in some instances where um, <clears throat> you're grazing native pasture, uh, broom sedge, blue stem is going to be one of those native options, um, but it doesn't have a lot of nutrient um, quality to it, value, excuse me. Um, and again, and then it's also not very palatable. Sure, cows aren't going to want to eat it either. So um, soil testing is the first step in managing broom sedge in an infested field. So this will take, and it will take a varying amount of time to correct this issue, depending on what your soil test recommends. So, you know, your soil test could recommend lime. It could recommend lots of uh, multiple applications of fertilizers. Um, so that could take a varying amount of time. Typically for liming, that's going to take up to six months to become available in the soil after you apply it. So it's going to take a few growing seasons to kick out this broom sedge. Um, <clears throat> it will shade out desirable species because it gets a lot taller. And um, so like your Bermuda grass, Bahia grass, some other forages, aren't going to be able to get sunlight underneath that canopy of the broom sedge. So can be an issue in that regard as well. So control, again, we want a soil test because neither mowing or doing a controlled burn are going to reduce your broom sedge populations. Um, the only effective option is spot spraying with glyphosate Roundup during the growing season. So again, your best method is going to be to manage that soil, get that taken care of. Um, and then if you still have a few clumps of broom sedge trying to hang on, then we can do a spot spray with glyphosate while they're growing. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on. So chickweed. Again, that's more of, or that's more of one that's going to be common in your lawns rather than your pastures, but it's still a good one to talk about. So on the left is going to be your common chickweed. On the right is your mouse ear chickweed. And you can see they look just ever so slightly different with the hair on the leaves and the shape of the leaves. They're both cool season annuals, so they're finishing up their growing season right now. They're common in lawns. And they're common in areas that are mowed too closely to the ground. So they both have prostrate to trailing stems. The smooth leaves are oval to elliptic in shape and they have an opposite arrangement. The flowers are usually white and in small clusters. They can be yellow in some cases. And both of these plants have very shallow roots. So um, chickweeds are common in lawns that are mowed too closely to the ground which is also common of many weeds, as you've heard me talk about. Um, it's important to raise your mower height and leave more grass, especially in the fall, for that last mow of the fall um, so that you can have more ground cover um, to hopefully lessen the incidence of weeds, of these winter weeds come late winter, early spring. So um, it also thrives in gardens where there is little to no mulching. So um, a good fix for that is three inches of mulch um, around your areas where nothing's growing in your garden around your desirable plants. So again, multiple species of these, um, and there's more than just these two. You've also got field chickweed, sticky chickweed. Um, some of them have hairy stems, some are smooth. Um, you can see here this common one is smooth. Common chickweed has smooth leaves. Um, Mouse ear chickweed has much more hair, as you can see in the picture. Uh, all chickweeds produce many seeds. Each plant can produce over 800 seeds and can lay dormant in the soil for up to 10 years. So control for chickweed. Mechanical is going to be a good option for around your garden area. Um, chemical control. A pre-emergent does work, but a post-emergent control may also be necessary. So post-emergent control, uh, selective broadleaf weed control with 
one of the active ingredients or a three-way mix of 2,4-D, MCPP, dicamba, or triclopyr, which they make products that are three-way mixes of those, so you don't literally have to go out and get three different products and mix them yourself. Okay, plantains. This is um, common plantain on the left, common or broadleaf plantain on the left, and buckhorn plantain on the right. They're both cool season perennials, and they are common in disturbed soils. So there are actually 13 species of plantains in Texas. Most of them are native cool season annuals, but three species are perennial, both of these. And then two species are not native, but introduced. Both of these are introduced. So all plantains are erect and stemless, which you can see there. All leaves originate from a crown at the base of the plant. You can see there, it looks almost like a rosette. And the annuals, well, I said that they form a rosette. And the rosette, they sit through, they sit as a rosette through the winter before the spring growth when they bolt up. So they can be found in various disturbed soils of pastures, roadside parks, lawns, and vacated areas. Both common and buckhorn plantain can compete with forages and pastures. Um, common or broadleaf plantain, which again, those are both common names for that plant, is again, cool season annual. It's an introduced plant. It's native to Europe. It has oval leaves and a rosette. The leaf surface is waxy with a few hairs and three large veins. The flowers are white and are produced at the top of long leafless stalks. The fruits are small in brown capsules and contain up to 30 seeds each. Buckhorn plantain on the right, which is going to be more common in pastures. Um, I've heard it talked about a lot more in East Texas as well. So also cool season perennial introduced, like I said, also native of Europe. It has much more narrow leaves, which you can see there, the difference between the two. And the, the um, spikes are densely flowered. Um, has similar veining on the leaves. And then the flowers, again, they're a little more crowded and at the top of those stems. <laughs> Control for both of these is going to be post-emergent control on an established stand. Um, it's going to be a 2,4-D mixed with either aminopyrrolid, dicamba, or picloram. So that's going to be like graze on next, weed master, or graze on P plus D. Okay, moving on to nettles. So stinging nettle on the left, Texas bull nettle in the middle, and horse nettle on the right. So none of these are actually in the same family or even really related at all, except that they sting. Um, so stinging nettle on the left there is the only one in the nettle family. All of these are warm season perennials. Um, stinging nettle, uh, the nettle family, it's called Uridicae, CEA. I'm not sure how you say that. Um, warm season perennial, it is spread by rhizome and seed. The flowers bloom from March to September. And it's a much smaller plant. Um, it can grow large, but the, um, the leaves are much smaller than the other two plants. So it blooms from March to September. It's common in uncultivated areas. It thrives in disturbed areas, roadside ditches, moist soil, and it's actually a common herbal medicine, something I learned in my research here today. Um, like I said, I met this the other day and it stung, but it was around our water troughs in our pasture and along the fence line. So, um, which makes sense. You know, we don't do a lot in those areas. Um, moist in that, in those areas typically. So that makes sense. Um, Texas bull nettle is actually in the spurge family. It is a native, hence the name. Um, it's spiny. It has deep roots. And it's, again, a warm season perennial. It has several spiny stems from one single root system. And when a stem is broken, it produces or releases a milky white sap. It flowers April through September and consists of about five to seven white um, flowers called sepals. 
the seeds are within a fruit within that that has a tough outer shell. Um, poor forage value for livestock. I'm not sure any livestock would want to eat it. I don't think it's very palatable. Um, it grows best in all soil types in Texas. It's most common in sandy soils, disturbed areas, and thrives in hot weather, which all makes sense um, from when I've met it in the middle of a pasture in the middle of summer. Um, it's a very aggressive <coughs> Excuse me. It's a very aggressive competitor with improved pastures. So very common to us. Horse nettle, oops. Horse nettle is actually in the nightshade family. Um, again, warm season perennial. The leaves, petioles, and stems all carry sharp spines, just like all of the above. Horse nettle can grow two to three feet tall. Um, it has oval five to seven lobed leaves. The flowers are bluish to purplish and grow in terminal clusters. So that flower is gonna be at the top of the plant. Control for stinging nettle is gonna be a 2,4-D mixed with aminopyrrolid, dicamba, or picloram. Um, so again, that's your Grazon Next, P plus D, or Weedmaster. Or you can spot spray with um, triclopyr or glyphosate. So control for Texas bull nettle, a post-emergent control with a product containing 2,4-D. So again, those same, same products I already mentioned. Products with MSM are a good alternative um, if you don't have anything with 2,4-D in it. So MSM, sulfuron methyl, I've mentioned that a few times. And again, a broadcast application of that's gonna be just fine. Horse nettle control, um, post-emergent control with 2,4-D or a mix of 2,4-D and picloram or dicamba is gonna be best for that. You could also use a product with MSM as an alternative if you don't have 2,4-D. Okay, um, last plant identification, and then we will um, quickly go through the last section so we can get y'all out of here. Okay, um, so I lied, there's two more plants. So um, yellow wood sorrel and red sorrel really have nothing in common at all. They're not in the same family. Yellow wood sorrel is an annual and red sorrel is a perennial. However, they both have the common name of sheep sorrel. Not sure how that happened, because um, literally the only thing that's the same about them is the name. So yellow wood sorrel, sorrel on the left, which fun fact, that little yellow flower looks just like buttercup's little yellow flower. So if you're not familiar and you've heard all about buttercup and how invasive it can be and how it has a toxic agent in it that's toxic to cattle, and you're seeing this one all around, you could easily be confused. Um, the leaf structures are much different from each other, but that little yellow flower, uh, it looks so similar to me. Um, okay, so yellow wood sorrel, cool season annual. It's commonly found in lawns and ornamental plantings. It has a creeping growth habit. It's a bushy plant, and the leaflets are um, three heart-shaped leaflets together, the yellow flowers. It has a taproot system, prefers moist soil and full sun, but it will grow in a variety of conditions, as you can see, even through the concrete. Red soil, sorrel, excuse me, red sorrel is actually in the buckwheat family. It's a cool season perennial. Um, it's a broadleaf. It's spread by rhizome underneath the soil. And again, it's an indicator of acidic soil or poor neglected soil. So the leaves are one to three inches long, which you can't really see in this picture, um, but they're arrow shaped and they stay basal at the ground level in a rosette formation. The flowers are red or yellow and bloom on spikes. So you can kind of see that there, the little blooms at the top of um, the leafless stem is what the spike is. It's commonly found in pastures, so it can be an issue um, for you guys. Control for both of these. Um, so hand pulling for either of them is going to work, especially for your yellow wood sorrel. 
A chemical pre-emergent for yellow wood sorrel, sorrel is going to be isoxaban or dipsafir. A post-emergent control is going to be the same one effective for both, and that's going to be a three-way mix of your 2,4-D, MCPP, and either dicamba or triclopyr. Okay, now the last set here. Um, Texas groundsel on the left and bitter sneezeweed on the right. So Texas groundsel is a cool season annual. Bitter sneezeweed is a warm season annual. These are unrelated, but they can look familiar. I know in these pictures they don't look anything alike, but I'm telling you out in the pasture, if you're not familiar um, and you don't know that one is a cool season and one is a warm season, then they can look a lot alike. Your bitter sneezeweed there on the right can have solid yellow flowers without that red center. So, okay, Texas groundsel, that's something we're seeing in our pastures right now. It's also known as squaw weed. Um, it's a cool season annual, grows 12 to 30 inches tall. Um, the leaves and stems have a whitish tint um, and they are hairy. That whitish tint comes from that hair. The leaves get smaller the higher up they go the stem. The blooms are showy yellow flowers produced in the spring and then it produces a white puff ball or globe seed head like a dandelion does. These are very abundant in East Texas sandy soils or freshly cleared forests. It has both of these have a toxic an agent that is toxic to cattle um, but not very common only if they eat just a whole lot of um, either of these weeds, then we will see that. So in Texas ground soil, it's an unidentified toxic agent. Um, several symptoms, including anorexia, depression, weight loss, um, as a last, you know, liver failure, cirrhosis, and eventual death. Um, cattle are more likely to consume young plants in the rosette stage in late fall or winter before it's bolted and produced that stem and um, bloom but only if they're out looking for food. So if you're not providing them with adequate um, hay or other supplemental feed, then, then that's only gonna be a problem. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Post-emergent control for Texas groundsel is you wanna do before it blooms, so it's too late to do it now, but a broadleaf herbicide containing 2,4-D, it's a pretty common one. Your bitter sneezeweed, that's a warm season annual, grows about 10 to 20 inches in height, so fairly similar. Um, it has a strong odor and a bitter taste. The leaves are narrow and located alternately on the stem. It's in the sunflower family. Um, it has similar yellow leaves that bloom in late spring to summer. And there are two varieties of bitter sneezeweed, one that has a yellow flower with that red center and one that has just a solid red flower or a solid yellow flower with a yellow center. Um, it's common in sandy or loamy soils and common to the eastern part of the state. So that's that's real common um, in our area. We'll see that. And so it's not too late to control for that. Um, in fact, if you start seeing these emerge here pretty soon, then um, you'll want to do a post-emergent emote gosh y'all, a post-emergent control product containing 2,4-D. So um, like I said, this one's real common and it can be an issue in East Texas. So you want to use 2,4-D on that one. So the toxic agent in this is sesquinterpene lactone. Um, again, it very seldom causes issues, but if they consume it at a high enough level, then um, then we'll see that toxicity. So in, in that milk or meat that is um, that you eat or drink from an animal that has had too much of this product is gonna have a very bitter taste and smell to it. Then of course that animal has symptoms, um, weakness, loss of coordination, vomiting, grinding of teeth and eventual death. Okay, let's see here, let's get through these. Okay, so the last section we're gonna talk about reading a pesticide label. Um, we're going to look at mixing ratios, what it says on that, um, appropriate use for specific plants, grazing restrictions, and PPE. So what I'm going to do now, um, we're going to go through Graze On Next and Remedy Ultra. And let's see here. 
Okay, we want to share this part of the screen now. Okay. All right, so I hope you all can see that. If you can't, let me know. Okay, so Gray's on next. Um, let's see here. So important things that we want to always look at, we want to know the product. The highlighter is supposed to be working here. So Gray's on next. It's for control of broadleaf weeds and certain woody plants on rangeland. Permanent grass pastures, including grasses grown for hay, um, conservation reserve program acres, and wildlife management areas. Okay, so that's what it's for. Then um, we go through the label. We'll see the active ingredients. There, it's going to be 2,4-D and um, that long product there. Okay, um, this lovely little picture here is indicating that you don't want to use compost from crops or from cattle that have grazed crops treated with graze on next. Okay, so that's what that's indicating. Then you've got your danger label there. Keep out of reach of children. Okay, um, PPE, that's on the next page. Personal protective equipment, so all mixers, loaders, applicators, flaggers, other handlers must wear long sleeve shirt and long pants, shoes and socks, protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves made of any waterproof material such as barrier laminate butyl rubber. Okay, so some products are going to require a um, chemical glove and it's just going to be a little bit thicker, a couple more layers of rubber and plastic or something like that. Um, some products may require you to wear a mask or a respirator. This one, you should be okay. Um, you want to wear a chemical resistant apron when mixing or loading. Of course, you want to clean up spills as soon as they happen. Okay, what else? So grazing restrictions, where is that at? Okay, so agriculture use requirements there. Um, so it's got do not enter or allow worker reentry into treated areas during the restricted entry interval, the REI. Okay, your environmental hazards. This product is toxic to aquatic invertebrates and may be toxic to fish. Drift or runoff may adversely affect aquatic invertebrates and non-target plants. Directions for use. So finally, after all that, we get down to directions for use. Okay. All right. So then it tells us. Finally, way down here, all the different application rates and management on page five. So where you can and can't spray. Table two is gonna be here, how to treat, what rate to treat at. Okay, okay, well, it's not letting me highlight the right thing. Then mixing instructions, below that, it's gonna tell us to prepare the spray, add half the required amount to water, mix with the agitator, and then add the rest of it. Um, it's got instructions on if you're gonna if you're gonna add surfactants or adjuvants to help it stick to the plants. Then um, the mixing ratio, which is what I was talking about here, if you're gonna mix it with other herbicides, so it's got that information on there. Okay, if you're gonna mix it with other products like Graze on Next, you can mix with Triclopyr, such as Remedy, Pasture Guard, Clopyrid, such as Reclaim, Picloram, which is in Surmount. Et cetera, et cetera. So all those questions, um, I get these questions a lot. You know, hey, can I mix this with that? Well, let's look at the label um, because the labels change, the ratios change, the directions change. Um, so even I, I can't memorize these at all. I have to look, look them up too. Um, okay, so another table that it's going to give us is going to tell you what weed species are controlled. OK, 
Okay, so it's got the common name, the scientific name, and then what type of plant it is. It's got even got what family it's in. So that's actually really helpful. Not a lot of people pay attention to that. Um, but there we are. So, I mean, horse nettle, one we talked about a little while ago. Um, woolly croton, that's a very common one in our area. And then even more. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover there um, on your reading a pesticide label. And then what I want to do is just show you how they can differ on different um, labels. So both of these are from Dow, which is now Corteva. So it's going to be fairly similar. Um, but looking at your Remedy Ultra, your active ingredient is up higher on the page. Your first aid environmental hazards, again, are up here higher on the page. Um, your PPE up here on that first page and looks like it's similar, but it also says to wear coveralls in addition to your gloves, socks, shoes, glasses. Okay. Um, it also has how to store it, which is pretty, pretty common. Or, you know, that's pretty simple. Um, grazing and haying restrictions. So here's one that's real easy to see. So grazing and haying restrictions for Remedy Ultra. Um, grazing green forage, there are no grazing restrictions for livestock or dairy animals on treated areas. Haying restrictions, you don't want to harvest hay within 14 days of an application of Remedy Ultra. And then slaughter restrictions, during the season of application, you want to withdraw livestock from, treating, from grazing treated areas at least three days before slaughter. So again, not all of these will, not all products have a grazing or haying restriction, but it's going to be on that label for you to see. Okay, this one is six pages. Again, it's got that tank mixing, how to mix it, mixing it with other products. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. Its list of the products it controls looks a little bit different. It's not in a chart. It's, you know, just listed in two little columns here. Um, okay, moving on to a different type of product. You know, this is just a common product anybody can pick up at your Lowe's or feed store, Home Depot, tractor supply. Um, you know, it looks a lot different. It's got all the pretty things on the front of it. It still has your active ingredient, sulfentrazone, which is not one I mentioned, actually. Um, then it's got its back page and usually will have a little fold out that'll have here directions for you still, the products that it um, that it controls and it'll have a PPE on here as well. Um, I didn't look at this one beforehand, so you'll have to excuse me. So it should have a PPE on here as well. Probably back up here at the top. So again, the point I'm just trying to make here is that all chemicals, whether they're restricted use or not, are going to have um, a label, they're going to have directions, they're going to have how to use them, how to mix it. Um, this one I think is ready to use, but anyways. Um, lastly, I wanted to go over an aquatic herbicide. Um, it's not going to look much different, especially because it's from Corteva or Dow as, as the first two, same as the first two ones were. So um, this is Rodeo, which is a glyphosate product but it is registered for use in aquatic weed control. So it'll say that annual weeds, easiest to control. Um, it's going to talk about applying in ponds or wet areas somewhere down here. So anyways, we've gone over our hour limit, so I'm not going to make y'all go into that and look at that. Um, close that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Go back so y'all can see me. Um, okay, so does anybody have any questions they want to go over before I let y'all go? You can type them in the little chat box there. Okay, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Um,